My name is Jeff Moore. I'm Senior Vice President and Chief Development Officer of Altarm Institute, and I really want to just take a very brief opportunity to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon for this Altarum Policy Roundtable on issues of integrated care delivery. Um, this is an exciting uh, event for us in, in a couple of ways. First of all, it's just a tremendously important topic and one on which, and you'll hear a little bit more from Scott Green, which we're doing some pretty exciting study. We have a terrific panel that's joining us today. And we're also trying a, a new format for our roundtables. For those of you who have been with us in uh, times past, you know we typically gather over lunch. Uh, we tried something a little different this time, and we hope that uh, those of you who are able to do so will join us at a reception following this session, which will end promptly at 5 o'clock. So again, my, my welcome to all of you, my thanks for joining, of, uh, joining us. For those of you who are not familiar with Altarum Institute, a nonprofit health systems research and consulting organization, we're actually headquartered in Ann Arbor, but the, the vast majority, quite frankly, of our technical staff is located here in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. These roundtables, <clears throat> we, we host quarterly. Uh, we are now into Marika, what our third year of the roundtable program, she's outside. Um, and uh, these have proven to be terrific opportunities to bring both staff and colleagues in the research community, the client community, the funding community, the academic community together for informal conversations around timely and critically important topics in health and healthcare. This is certainly one of those topics. So we do encourage you, and you'll hear more from Scott in just a moment, to use the time to listen, to learn, to question, to be in conversation, and then we hope at the end of the session to join us for some refreshments, which I understand will be directly downstairs. So with that, let me introduce Dr. Scott Green. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I was given seven minutes to speak, but Jeff has just said about four and a half minutes of what I was supposed to say. So, um, and besides, most of you did not come here to listen to me anyway. So what I want to do, first of all, is welcome you all. Uh, we really appreciate it, especially uh, I'm the lead for behavioral health at Altarum. Um, one of what we see as a vital uh, topic in relation, if when you think about healthcare reform and parity legislation, when you think about workforce shortages, when you think about uh, uninsured uh, consumers needing care, um, this is a topic that is critical to uh, what is going on nationally. Um, and in thinking about uh, as part of the discussion on patient-centered medical homes, in thinking about how community health centers can play a role in helping to address uh, what is really some uh, a, a very serious need uh, for services in communities. Um, th this is an exciting conversation uh, to have, and I'm I'm happy to be uh, to be sitting up here. Uh, and I wanted to thank our our speakers who. Really, for, for those of you who, who may not know, if you're having a discussion about integrated, integrated primary behavioral health care, um, you will see these names. And, and so uh, it, it's exciting to have um, really such an, an expert panel uh, be a part of today. Um, what we're trying to accomplish overall is to stimulate thinking. Uh, we really want to make this an opportunity both for learning but engagement on both sides, bi-directional, um, and, and providing everyone with an opportunity to connect with each other, but connect with these issues um, especially. And what I will think, what I want to plant a seed for is that by the end of this, uh, by the end of our presentations, um, and when we get to a discussion portion. What I want people to think of as, as in addition to the questions that you may have is what are the what nexts, if I can butcher the English language. Okay. Thinking about where we go from here and making this as, as productive a discussion as possible. Um, 
for the speakers, be bold. This is about pushing envelopes. This is about advancing discourse and dialogue. Uh, be as prescriptive as you feel comfortable um, in terms of how policymakers and, uh, and the other stakeholders in this process can, uh, can drive these issues forward. And to think at a systems level. This is not something that one person at one individual level is going to be able to address. This is about thinking holistically in terms of uh, systems. Uh, you all have a responsibility as well, um, and that is to listen, to engage, to talk. Um, we really need to hear as much from you as you hope to hear from, uh, from the panelists here. So I uh, appreciate it. In terms of administrative things, we're going to run through our presentations, which should last about an hour. And then we're going to have a block of time to have those kinds of discussions. So you have pens in front of you. Um, and if you can just jot your questions down, we can come back to them uh, during our discussion period, if you don't mind. Um, if uh, once we get to the discussions, if you have a question or a comment that you'd like to make, there are microphones in front of you. There is a button that says push to talk. All you have to do is hit that. The microphone will light up. You'll know you're being recorded uh, or, and so that people can hear as well. And then you just hit it when you're done uh, to, to turn it back off. Um, please take all your phones, either turn them off or put them on vibrate if you don't mind. That would be great. Uh, and I think, um, you know, that really, uh, that's really it. Uh, again, excited to have this, um, this event and for you all to be a part of it. So looking forward to it. Uh, we're going to start off. Um, well, let me just tell you just briefly, um, you have biographies in front of you of all of our speakers, but Dennis Freeman is CEO of Cherokee Health Systems uh, based in Tennessee. That uh, is one of, uh, is an exciting center that has been doing integrated care for years and years and are seen as experts in this. Dr. Sandy Blunt, uh, clinical professor of family medicine and psychiatry at University of Massachusetts Medical School. Um, Peggy Clark and Nancy Kirchner from the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. And Mary Rainwater, who is uh, the project director for California's Integrated Behavioral Health Project. So, um, so we have some great expertise here. So I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna turn it over to Dennis who will be our first speaker. So. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I've looked forward to the opportunity to be here to exchange some views with my panel, fellow panel members and with those of you in the audience. Let's see if I can figure out how to advance everything here. There we go. Well, there's lots of, lots of buzz, lots of interest, lots of excitement about the integration of behavioral health and primary care these days. I think policymakers, payors, providers, all really seem to concur. There's really uh, a lot of promise in this paradigm. And the interest really has been bolstered by some recent studies showing not only improved clinical outcomes, but also cost savings as well. The community mental health centers are really compelled to pursue integration because there's been some recent data that talks about the poor health status and the premature deaths of folks with serious mental illness, dying at an average age of 53, dying literally in the gulf that separates mental health system from general medical care. And the disease management folks, I think, have learned that the best medical protocols really fall short unless the behavior is of patients are a focus. So successful management of chronic disease is really dependent on patients embracing self-management goals and behavior change. Health policy experts talk about the healthcare home and key to the healthcare home, key to the success of it is really an informed and a behaviorally activated patient. If we look at the community mental health system around the country, there's some differences from state to state, but generally speaking, I think we have to say that really the mission of community mental health has changed quite a bit over the years. 
access is really now limited, generally in states, by some criteria, diagnosis, severity of condition, sometimes ability to pay. So the policy shifts, the increased regulation, the state budget woes have really taken their toll. And in short, the doorway to community mental health has really narrowed and there are waiting lists every place. On the other hand, the FQHC system is really poised for explosive growth. And these are the federally qualified health centers. In the healthcare reform legislation, there is about $11 million expected, $11 billion expected for the FQHCs over the next five years. The current uh, appropriation is about $2 billion a year. So really there are a couple of paradigm shifts, I think, occurring across safety net organizations, one at the systems level and one at the clinical level. And both of them are generally referred to as integration. There's a shift in the locus of clinical care for folks who need treatment for mental health problems from really from mental health providers to primary care providers and for the uninsured population from the community mental health centers to the federally qualified health centers. Not only is there an awareness of the prevalence of psychiatric conditions in primary care, and there's an acknowledgement that the majority of mental health interventions occur there, I think there's growing acceptance that primary care is the preferred location for most behavioral interventions. The other paradigm shift is occurring at the clinical level where, primary, where behaviorists are becoming members of primary care teams, not only entering the primary care arena, but actually becoming members of those primary care teams. So everyone seems to be jumping on the integration bandwagon, but I think some nagging questions remain, like what do we mean by integration? What is it? Some people think of integration as merely improved communication between mental health professionals and medical providers. Some describe integration as tighter referral linkages, screening for mental health problems in medical settings or outstationing providers. These are sometimes referred to as integration. So there's some question about how, how do we define it? What is it? How do we do it? And given all the confusion about the concept of integration, translating it into operations is really challenging for a lot of organizations. Who can do it? Where do we find behaviorists who know their way around primary care, who are comfortable in primary care? Of course, there are questions about how to pay for it. And what are the results? Is it proven? Is it really a better way? Is it worth the effort? And analysis of the outcomes is really difficult sometimes because of all the multiple concepts and models we hear about integration. But if we take a closer look at what goes under the banner of integration, we see a lot of clinical activity that's probably more described as co-location, like co-locating a psychotherapy practice into a primary care setting. And this slide illustrates some of the differences between clinical integration of behaviorists into the primary care team and the mere co-location of mental health professionals under a primary care roof. So when you think about what's, co what's integration, what's co-location, I think to put it succinctly, is the work of the behavioral health professional an ancillary service or is it a vital and routine component of the primary care visit, much as lab, x-ray, and nursing support are part of that visit? In integration, there's a shared clinical record and a common treatment plan. So integration is more than a service. It's more than a program. It's really a new orientation to care, a new way of thinking about care, a new way of organizing care. Cherokee Health Systems began as a community mental health center actually 50 years ago last month. We took mental health services into primary care clinics in the 1970s. We hired a family doc and began providing primary care 26 years ago with a psychologist working in tandem with that physician. 
We entered the federally qualified health center world in 1987, and today we're one of a small number of community mental health center FQHC hybrids in the country. This is a quick snapshot of our organization, uh, 21 clinical locations in 14 East Tennessee counties. If you think of Knoxville as an urban area, then we have urban sites and we also uh, have a lot of rural locations. We also have specialized programs for homeless, for migrants, and for refugees. We see a lot of folks, uh, pretty close to 60,000 unduplicated patients last year. 43% of them are on Medicaid, about 30% are uninsured. You see our provider base there, we have uh, last count 538 employees, 40 psychologists, 47 primary care providers, and then some other uh, mental health staff. For, uh, for many years, we've really focused on clinical integration, the interplay between and among primary care providers, behaviorists, and their patients. We really don't talk about integration anymore in our organization. It's simply our care model. That's the way that we take care of folks. In this uh, care model, we have behavioral health consultants, we call them BHCs, uh, who are embedded full-time members of the primary care team. In our system, these BHCs are typically health service providers in psychology. Psychiatric consultation is also available. The BHCs provide brief, targeted, real-time interventions to address psychosocial aspects of primary care. So in the typical scenario, patients comes in, sees the primary care provider. The PCP determines that some kind of psychosocial factors, behavioral, emotional factors are underlying the presenting complaints, so they're getting in the way of positive response to treatment. So during that visit, the PCP hands off the patient to the BHC for assessment or intervention. And these BHCs are involved in a wide range of patient presentations, not just when psychiatric disorders show up. BHCs assist in chronic disease management with conditions like asthma, diabetes, COPD. They help patients select and then monitor self-management goals. BHCs help patients design strategies for stress management, weight management, smoking cessation, parenting. You, you get the drift. The overarching goal is to enhance the coping skills and build resiliency of the patients in the practice. And when uh, psychiatric conditions are suspected, the BHC helps with definitive diagnosis and they provide behavioral interventions. So from the description of these activities, it should be clear, this is not psychotherapy co-located to the doctor's office. It's a new paradigm, a behavioral medicine paradigm, a paradigm that fits neatly into the pace and flow of primary care, and the concept of the healthcare home. <clears throat> At Cherokee, uh, we've embraced the healthcare home model and taken it really, I think, a step further, augmenting the primary care team with this embedded behavioral health consultant. The BHC provides real-time consultation to the PCP and direct care to the patient. Psychiatric consultation <clears throat> is also available to both the PCP and the behavioral health consultant. It's a focused behavioral intervention in primary care. The goal is to keep patients in primary care it's a behavioral medicine scope of practice, broader in scope than just psychiatric disorders. Patient responsibility is key. It's a behaviorally enhanced healthcare home, if you will, enhanced by a focus on the behavioral aspects of every patient presentation. Some of our outcomes, penetration rate, uh, this model is very attractive to patients. It draws significant penetration. In some of the rural counties, we're seeing a third of all the residents and half of all the Medicaid folks over a three-year period of time. This care model helps manage utilization, allowing us to see more patients. We involve BHCs with a group of our high utilizing patients and we saw a 28% decrease in subsequent medical utilization. 
the model decreases referrals to specialty mental health care. Patients who had seen a behavioral health consultant had 27% fewer visits to psychiatrists and 34% fewer psychotherapy visits. So it really keeps folks out of the more expensive specialty care system. Focusing on a patient's health behaviors improves outcomes and adherence. As a federally qualified health center, we report on a number of clinical measures to the Bureau of Primary Health Care. For example, measures of diabetes management, uh, control of hypertension. Our outcomes are typically superior to state and national averages. This care model focuses on what the patient can do to improve health outcomes. Studies have revealed that probably half of the patients with chronic disorders don't follow their medical regimen. In this model, behaviorists help patients define objective, measurable self-management goals, and then their providers, both primary care and behavioral together, jointly monitor and support patients in achieving these objectives. It's a co-management model. Do patients like it? 87% of our patients told us they prefer receiving their mental health care in primary care. It's their health care home. It's where they feel most comfortable. And PCPs are absolutely delighted with the resources that this embedded behaviorist model provides them. Well, these Cherokee outcomes I presented have, have really been documented in the professional literature by it's the experience of other providers of integration as well. So the benefits really appear obvious, but in this current healthcare environment, integration will only thrive if it catches the fancy of payers. During contract negotiations with Blue Cross, one of our Medicaid managed care plans in Tennessee, their CFO was kind enough to share some data with us. And he said, we've looked at your service utilization and we've looked at your costs and we've compared that with other primary care providers with whom we contract. And we found that you have more primary care visits and we think that's a good thing because we want patients locked into their healthcare homes. But we also found that your patients use specialists less often, 58%, only about one third of the expected rate of emergency room visits. Hospital days were lower and costs were 78% of their anticipated figure. So Blue Cross likes us. We have a good relationship with Blue Cross. Some thoughts about financing integrated care. The care model should dictate the payment methodology rather than the other way around. Integrated care is a unique care model with different provider activities and different services. So it stands to reason that the old service delivery payment mechanisms probably won't work. It's not exactly the same as just mental health and primary care side by side, it's really different. So some of the barriers, some of the disincentives to integration, mental health carve outs of course further isolate the behavioral health world from the rest of healthcare. Excessive documentation, especially the community mental health world, but to some extent the mental health world is notorious for crushing paperwork documentation demands. There's just no time for it in primary care. The prohibition on billing two services on the same day, this prevents PCPs from handing off to behaviorists those patients for quick, inexpensive, and cost-reducing interventions. Absolute reliance on fee-for-service reimbursement is another disincentive. When done well, integration reduces encounters. The efficiency, the cost reductions the model produces are to be found in the clinical activities which don't reduce to a CPT code. Antiquated coding requirements. Clinical innovations always precede the necessary financing and bureaucratic support to sustain them. So the CPT codebook always lags. Payment policies should support, not thwart, clinical innovation. 
In addition to the funding challenges, refining the integration paradigm poses some other questions for policymakers, payors, and providers. Since most mental health problems are treated only in primary care, why do most behaviors practice elsewhere? Is the publicly supported academic health manpower pipeline providing the appropriately trained workforce to meet the public need? Can we continue to train health professionals in silos and expect them to work well in teams? Are we training behavioral health clinicians who have the skill set to work with medical providers? Are we generating the right mix of primary care providers and specialists? Since so much of primary care is behavioral in nature, why is the treatment primarily biochemical in response? Why do we have two separate community-based safety net systems when most patients of each system need the services of both? Not long ago, community mental health centers and federally qualified health centers didn't seem to know one another. Now in many communities, they're really clamoring to collaborate. Wonder what the safety net organization in the future will look like. Since primary care behavioral health integration enjoys such a claim, why is there so little of it in existence? It appears to me it's time to move beyond the rhetoric and the over-inclusive definitions and put this powerful paradigm to work. Hi, I am Alexander Blunt called Sandy. That's what people look when they said introduce this person called Sandy over here. Um, I'm going to tell the story that is behind what Dennis just said um, and come at it uh, from the point of view of the patient-centered medical home. There are more stories, by the way, about integrated care on the website of this event. I sent in a document called Stories About Integrated Care. And so you, you will find a day in the life of a primary care physician and how people present and what statistically you're likely to find uh, in those presentations and what the story behind each of those presentations might be. And the person I'm going to talk about in this presentation is there and with an example of how a care manager would make a difference in her care. So I want to talk just a brief, briefly about the patient-centered medical home. Uh, it is a beautiful ship on the horizon. Um, we can see the gorgeous colors and the rigging. Uh, we do not know how long it's going to take uh, to bring this, this, thing, this beautiful ship into port and what kind of shape she's going to be in when she gets there. Um, but right now, it is, uh, the, it is the next big thing. And the patient-centered medical home is an idea that has been supported by the payers, the employers, uh, the guild groups of physicians, the health systems, um, and it involves um, a personal physician or primary care provider with an ongoing relationship with the patient, um, a team of individuals so that the, the physician is not doing everything and the whole team is working, as they say, at the top of their license so that more things can pass to the team. Um, it is a whole person orientation, whatever you bring to that door of the health home, the behavior, the uh, medical home or healthcare home, you came to the right place because we're either going to do it for you or we're going to find somebody who does. And um, we are going to um, have care coordinated or integrated across service systems and provide care in a culturally and linguistically appropriate manner, particularly using and use information technology to make a lot of services possible that don't involve coming to the doctors, that right now do involve coming to the doctors. And so doctors are freed up uh, to see fewer patients for longer time, and patients are more empowered to be a part of the team. It sounds great. Um, 
All right. And it saves money. Um, about, Dennis talked about the savings that they have, um, have realized. That's found generally. Essentially, there is a group of folks with complex needs that tend to be uncoordinated. They just go where the, the, they think they should be going uh, as often as they think they should be going there. And that, that group of people, however, whatever slice you take, uses about four times that percentage of the cost. Um, and so if we are able to um, make this work, we're going to save enough money to pay for anything that we might uh, add in order to do it. Now, the usual approach to this is to um, get patients, try and talk patients into signing up, people with complex chronic illnesses. Um, we try and target folks by, by diagnosis. And so we have an intervention for the diabetics and the most expensive or most out of control diabetics get care managers. Um, we focus on the, the highest utilizers. We rely on patients saying what they're doing uh, rather than a uh, often tight loop of uh, data. And we assume that chronic and complex disease drives all the cost. The problem is it doesn't work that way. It turns out that the medical only complex high cost patient is in a distinct minority. And in fact, those folks are folks for whom there is often little impact when care management comes because they're as sick as they are. And they're going to need the level of services they're getting. It's, and be, it, it turns out that the sicker you are, the sicker you are that if you are, the more somatic illness you have, the more psychiatric illness you're likely to have. And the underlying um, uh, characteristics that, or aspects that co correlate with psychiatric illness also correlate with somatic illness. Um, when Boeing did a big implementation of um, the healthcare home, they saved some money, they're very proud of it, but one of their ultimate uh, statements about what they did was, we had no idea the behavioral health needs were so big. We missed that in planning for our program. So I wanna tell you the story of one person. This is um, a person that I was involved, whose care I was involved in, and whom I came to enjoy um, a great deal. Um, this is how she presents to the medical world. She is in about order of how dangerous her conditions are. She has chronic throm thrombocytopenia, which is a bleeding disorder, makes people uh, prone to internal bleeding. She has heart disease, she's had a bypass, she has COPD and is a smoker. Uh, she has insulin dependent diabetes, arthritis, bipolar disorder, um, uh, at least that's a, a disorder that follows her in her chart. Recurrentary, recurrent urinary, fact, recurrentary, that's a pretty good word. Uh, recurrent urinary tract infections and obesity. So here's the, her medications, for those of you who know medications. Um, I'm not gonna go through them. But the statistics that really describe her in terms of the experience of the providers were her number one in the calls to the on-call line, averaging often two or three calls a night, um, highest utilization in the practice, in a, the patients of a large practice, um, for at one period of time averaging well over two times a week to the ER, um, and Rank in eliciting frustrated comments from nurses and residents, number one. Um, that is not something we actually tracked statistically, but you can believe me when I tell you this. Um, so she is a good candidate for a case manager. She's complex and she's really expensive. And because her husband was a retired steel worker, she had good insurance. And so Blue Cross gave her a case manager who called her up 
to talk to her about diabetes because she's in the diabetes cohort. She could have been in several cohorts, but she happened to be in the diabetes cohort. And in that program, the, care, the manager would call up and she would tell the manager how miserable she was, how much pain she was in, how nobody listened to her, and how her husband was nigh unto abusive, swearing at her all the time. Until ultimately, at one point, the case manager got so concerned that she reported it to the um, elder um, abuse line, uh, and it wasn't substantiated when it was investigated. And ultimately, the case manager gave up and went away. Um, in fact, that's pretty typical. It turns out that when you look at the, uh, the experience of case managers who don't have behavioral health training, when they deal with folks with mental disorders, they find it very difficult. And so, in fact, you, you see a retreat in of the workforce from the patients when they're not trained for this kind of complexity. So why should behavioral health be a core service in the patient-centered medical home? Um, well, 50% better access to mental health care, even when you do the kind of enhanced referral that should be a part of the patient-centered medical home you're still gonna get 50% better access when the service is in primary care than when the people go across town. Complex patients with chronic illness needing behavioral health care are more likely to be designated for medical home level care. Care in medical settings is a better cultural fit for many patients. Culturally, many patients do not want to go to specialty mental health. It is too stigmatizing for them. Um, Behavioral health clinicians free up time for the PCPs. I'm just echoing, Dennis. And care management is more effective when done by professionals with behavioral health skills. So, the story of think change for Joan. I got involved with Joan um, when I was working with one of the residents who had to see her one day, and she said, would you come in and see this person with me, because I do not know what to do, and I know she's going to make this visit go on forever. And so I came in, and there was this woman. She's very short. She looked sort of like a stack of pumpkins sitting in her wheelchair, and her tall, straight, erect, lanky, uh, husband who pushes the wheelchair, standing there being good and silent. And um, the, the, she told me the story again of how she has tar terrible aches and terrible pains and something really bad must be wrong today because of these pains and, um, and that her husband is not tolerant of her suffering. And I used a technique that is Family Systems 101. That is, if you have a recurrent pattern and it always goes that way, assume it's circular. And if it's circular and everybody can see the causation one direction, assume that the extra, the information you need is causation going the other way. So I said, okay, well, Arthur does a lousy job of taking care of Joan I wonder if Joan is taking care of Arthur. And I suggested that really sort of without any data. Joan, is it possible that you are taking care of Arthur? And she said, you're smart, aren't you? <laughs> and so that was enough to engage her so that she and Arthur came to see me. And we worked out the pattern of an ER visit, the standard pattern. And that is, Joan and Arthur go to bed at 10 o'clock, feeling okay about things. At midnight or around there, Joan wakes up and has a terrible pain or, and it's different every night. And um, she calls out to Arthur who's sleeping on the couch. And Arthur comes in and if he's feeling calm, if he's feeling centered, if he's feeling good, he lays hands on Joan and they pray together and then they both feel comfortable, and she goes back to sleep, and he goes to sleep sometimes in the same bed. If, however, Arthur is feeling stressed or angry or overwhelmed, he yells from the living room that she's 
driving him crazy, he swears a lot, and that she's ruining his life, and that he can't possibly go on like this anymore. At which point, Joan escalates, and in order to avoid conflict, they go to the emergency room, where everybody knows her, and Arthur catches a few winks over in the corner, and the doctors and nurses tend to Joan, and sometime around 10 in the morning, they go home, and they're really tired, and they sleep for three or four hours, and then they have a nice afternoon. That's the pattern. The system can't find it, though. They just do more of what they do, because that's what they do, unless you have somebody located in the practice to say, how do we tease this out? How do we see how this might make sense? And that was what was able to happen. So behavioral health services are now being advocated to be part of the medical home by the two organizations that accredit medical homes. Um, when options arise, we need to be able to develop new stories or descriptions of familiar events. And um, so when health system is stuck with unhelpful patterns, we need to look for another story. And the details of that story are going to be somewhere in the patient's social network and most likely in the family. And so patient-centered medical home care managers need access to skills in family interviewing and systems thinking in addition to skills in CBT, relaxation therapy, and motivational interviewing. Notice I said need access to. Not that everybody has to be able to do the, everything, but they've got to have somebody that they can get to that can help them with these kinds of cases. And so how do we get these skills out there? Well, one is you have a behavioral health consultant. You, exactly the folks that Dennis was talking about. That's the best way. It's not a way that every practice can uh, do. Um, or you have a properly trained clinician, uh, often it's a psychiatrist or a psycho health psychologist, but it's somebody who understands um, primary care and chronic illness, provides supervision to a care manager who has some behavioral health training. That's the IMPACT model. If you Google the IMPACT program, you'll find a lot of data. Um, Right now at UMass, we have a training program for mental health and substance abuse clinicians who want to learn to work in primary care. And so one of the ways we've addressed, it, addressed the workforce issue is to be able to retrain folks who are in mental health centers to work in primary care. And it takes uh, uh, six all-day workshops six, six-hour workshops that we do one a month for six months and that we video conference all over the country and Canada and other places. Um, and if you would like to talk further, there's my info and the um, website of the program that we use to train primary care behavioral health folks. Thank you. Uh, now we have Peggy Clark, Nancy Kirshner from CMS. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting CMS to take part in the Institute. Um, I am a technical director in the Disabled and Elderly Health Programs Group within the Center for Medicaid, CHIP, and Survey and Certification within the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And so I thought when I even started to think how I would introduce my remarks that it might be helpful to um, bring along, and that's what's going around, this yellow sheet, which is an organizational chart, to give you a little bit of a feel for the agency, because it is an important agency, and if you have any dealings with it, I think this chart might be helpful. Um, on one side, you have the sort of overview of the full agency, and on the reverse side, um, the information around the um, organization in the Center for Medicaid, CHIP, which stands for Children's Health Insurance Program and Survey and Certification. Um, 
I wanted to say something else quickly before I started. The word integration is kind of um, an interesting one. At CMS, when we hear integration, we think about the integration of Medicare and Medicaid. And we think of folks who are eligible for both programs. And um, I've heard it referred to as the Medi-Medi program. So that might be a new term for you to take home with you. But of course, today we're here to talk about the integration of Okay, thank you. Um, to talk about the integration of uh, behavioral health and primary care. And really the beginning uh, slides will give you some basic information around Medicaid. Some of you may be very um, knowledgeable and some of you may need a little bit of Medicaid 101. Since I really wasn't sure, I thought it might be helpful for all of us to sort of be on the same playing field. Um, in 2009, there were over um, 65 million people enrolled in Medicaid. From this slide, you can see a breakdown. 5.8 uh, ages 65 or older, 9.5 million blind or disabled, and 31.3 enrolled as eligible children. In 2008, federal and state government gross Medicaid out uh, outlays were $351.8 billion. Medicaid is the largest payer for mental health services in the United States. In terms of Medicaid services, some are optional and states have considerable flexibility in benefit design. You've probably heard of the saying, if you know one Medicaid program, you know one Medicaid program. And it's really very true. Um, I want to um, convey my thanks to Jeff Buck Next slide. Um, from SAMHSA and his contractor, Thompson Reuter, uh, for the collection of this data and the use of the slides, and there are several of them throughout the presentation. They're all based on 2005 data. The information on slides four and five um, are based on 2005 data, and they tell about Medicaid mental health, 10.9%, and substance abuse, 0.7% service users. The next slide shows expenditures for mental health, 29.9%, and substance abuse, 1.8% service users. So you can see the whole pie chart, and you can see the portion of it which is spent for Medicaid, uh, mental health and substance abuse. Now the next slide shows the costly physical conditions for persons age 22 to 64, and that's sort of the dark blue tower, versus all Medicaid uh, beneficiaries ages uh, 22 to 64. I um, stuck this slide in because I want to perhaps put in a plug for the area of Medicaid in which I work. Uh, it's a short list of the Disabled and Elderly Health Programs Group goals around mental health and substance use disorders. We support effective services and supports, improved integration of physical and behavioral health, person-centered, consumer-directed care that supports successful community integration, and improved accountability and program integrity to ensure that Medicaid is a reliable funding source. Next one. I'd like to go over uh, some key points about Medicaid and mental health. Medicaid funded a growing share of mental health treatment. You can see from 17% uh, in 1986 to 28% in 2005. Don't have more recent figures, but I believe that is still uh, going up. However, med uh, mental health remained a small share of all Medicaid spending, just 10% in 2005. Medicaid spending on uh, mental health prescription medications increased rapidly from 7% uh, in 1928 to 27% in 2005. This is of all Medicaid mental health spending. Hospital and long-term care mental health treatment financed by Medicaid declined as a share of Medicaid mental health spending. And the next slide is some key points about Medicaid and substance abuse spending. 
Medicaid funded, uh, funded uh, a rising share of total substance abuse uh, spending from 12% in 1986 to 20% 20 in 2005. However, substance abuse spending remained a very small and falling share of all Medicaid spending, it was just 1% in 2005. Medications currently do not play a very significant role in the amount of spending for substance abuse treatment. Share of all Medicaid spending in outpatient settings more than doubled. Inpatient and residential settings, the share fell from 1986 to 2005. Now the next couple of slides is really information around Medicaid state plan benefits and state plan options for mental health services. Um, mental health would be an optional service, which means every state Medicaid program does not have to provide mental health services, but most of them do. Um, I hope you take a look at these. You can see the categories of mandatory and optional services. And then the slide following, which um, talks about um, state options for providing mental health services. Okay, slide 12. This slide contains a list of waiver and demonstration authorities from the Social Security Act, which you may, very, may be very familiar with. But again, these are, are important authorities because states may choose uh, from among these authorities for the most efficient way for the state to provide services to Medicaid beneficiaries. CMS has 10 regional offices and staff in the regions as well as the central office, which is located in Baltimore, provide technical assistance and help states to understand the various provisions of these authorities, the law and the regulation behind them, and to allow states to decide the very best way that they may go about um, achieving the goals and outcomes that they wish to have for their Medicaid beneficiaries. Now the next slide, is really informational, as is the one following. One of the authorities mentioned in the previous slide is 1915B, which are freedom of choice waivers. And this is a list of the states that have approval for those types of waivers. The uh, team that reviews and approves the applications for 1915B waivers includes staff from CMS regional offices, uh, CMS central office, staff from the Office of Management and Budget, from SAMHSA and from HRSA. We have really good team of folks and we do our very best to um, carefully review and approve these applications. Now the next slide is a list of states that have received approval from CMS to provide services through 1915C, home and community-based services, uh, to children with serious emotional disturbances and to adults age 18 and older. I'm going to now turn the mic to, over to Nancy Kirshner, also from the Disabled and Elderly Health Programs Group, and she will take a few minutes to tell you about health homes, chronic conditions, and 1915I, community, home and community-based services offered under the state plan. Thank you very much, Peggy. Thank you, everyone. Is that okay with the mic? I'm a little bit shorter. I probably have to move it down. That usually happens to me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we're very excited because in the Affordable Care Act um, or health reform, we use the term Affordable Care Act at, um, at CMS and we have acronyms to go with everything. Um, but um, the first one I wanna talk about is the health homes provision. Um, you've heard a lot of discussion from the other panel members about the patient-centered medical home, the medical home, the integration of behavioral health and primary health care. And we're very excited about the health home. Um, I thought the analogy of, of the ship and what it, what it, how long it's going to take and what it's going to look like by the time it gets there was very apt. Um, we are in the process now at CMS of going through many, many of the provisions related to health reform and how that's going to be implemented. But just to give you a little bit of a run through of some of the things that are covered in legislation specifically, this is um, uh, section 2703 in the Affordable Care Act. It's about, um, it's called state options to provide health homes for enrollment with chronic conditions. And when we think about the integration here, um, obviously today's focus is, is related to the medical care, the somatic care, and behavioral health care. But we're also thinking, when we look at people with chronic conditions, of looking at integrating primary and long-term supports. And I think that's very, very important to think about because um, the uh, the connections um, and place, I guess, 
Perhaps the need for connections is very important and the possibilities for fragmentation are very great there as well. Um, when Peggy was talking about what we meant when we talked about integration that between Medicaid and Medicare, I think also we're looking at that integration between kind of the health care you get at the doctors and then what that means in terms of the long-term kinds of supports, informal and formal supports that people need to live successfully in the community. Um, one of the basis, basic components in here is that if a state submits a state plan amendment and states will be eligible to submit a state plan amendment for health homes through Medicaid um, as of January 1st of 2011, they would receive an, an increased um, federal matching percentage, 90% um, federal, 10% for the state, which is which is pretty significant um, for most states for eight quarters, um, which would basically translate into two years, but um, the uh, terminology um, in the legislation is for eight quarters. Um, there's uh, some flexibility. Um, the secretary can offer planning grants. There would be a state match for those planning grants. CMS has done some planning grants where there's um, pretty much money coming um, directly from, from the Fed, so this would have a, a fairly um, sizable state match with that. The states are going to have to offer um, a designated provider, a team of healthcare professionals, or a health team for people that would, for beneficiaries that would opt for this. Um, there's an opportunity for states to have alternative methods of payment, not just a per member per month payment for that. Um, we are required to coordinate with SAMHSA on this provision, which is very exciting and I think speaks to the integration with behavioral health care. Um, there's going to need to be in the state plan. There's going to have to be tracking for avoidable hospitalizations. I think that was something that was talked about, emergency room visits and hospitalizations that could be avoided. Um, use of health information technology is very important, and there's going to be a requirement to report on quality measures. Eligible folks with chronic conditions would need to have at least two chronic conditions, one chronic condition, and be at risk of a second chronic condition, or have one serious and persistent mental illness. So certainly a recognition of the importance of um, the mental health piece in this. The chronic conditions that are specifically listed in the statute are a mental health condition, substance use disorder, asthma, diabetes, heart disease, and a body mass index over um, 25. The health home services that are specifically stipulated in the legislation are comprehensive care management, care coordination and health promotion, comprehensive transitional care, patient and family support, which I think is a really interesting one and something that certainly goes well beyond the bounds of, of a doctor's office and a doctor's visit, um, and referral to community and social support for people. There's an evaluation to Congress that's going to be required by January 1 of 2017, and there's going to be state re um, reported quality measures that are required. So more to come on that, certainly, but it is an exciting provision and one, I think, um, for, for CMS that is really testing our own ability to integrate. For us on the Medicaid side to have dialogue with our partners on the Medicare side because they've done a lot of demonstrations in the area of medical homes and also to bring together different um, different groups within um, Medicaid that deal with different aspects of people's health care. Um, the other piece that I want to mention just very briefly is um, is an update to the 1915I provision. Um, that's 2402B in the Affordable Care Act, and the 1915I was introduced in the Deficit Reduction Act in 2005. There are some significant changes, and the reason that we wanted to highlight the 1915I is because we think it shows real promise in states being able to provide long-term supports to people with mental health issues in a way that um, some of the other state plan options and certainly has been somewhat of a challenge, although Peggy certainly talked about how the 1915Bs and the 1915Cs have been able to do that. But particularly with the 1915I, it delinks the institutional level of care from being able to provide services, which is something that's that's a, a key component of the 1915C and has been problematic um, for people with mental health issues um, because of the uh, institutions for mental disease, the exclusion um, from those as a, as a qualified institution for the 1915Cs. And I'm sorry, I'm getting into a lot of acronyms going quickly. There are five states that have approved 1915Is now. Um, there are some very key changes, though, in, in the Affordable Care Act that I want to mention to you. Two of them are really not considered that favorable, at least from what we've heard from a variety of states, um, and, but many others are considered to be favorable. 
Um, previously, in, in the Deficit Reduction Act, states could limit the numbers of people that entered into an eye, which means that the states would have some ability to predict the costs that they would incur. Um, and there are no limits on the participants now as a result of the Affordable Care Act. The other thing that states could do previously is they could do limits to state wideness. So, for example, if they wanted to provide a 1915i in just one or several counties or part of the state, they could do that. Now there is no longer an ability on the part of the state to limit statewideness. So the states that already have approved 1959s, and this is the same with any state plan amendment, will have to bring those into compliance as of October 1st of 2010. But there are some positive provisions. Um, previously, um, in, in the uh, 1959I, in the, um, the Deficit Reduction Act, um, states couldn't target populations. Now that states can target popu populations, um, there's an ability to do these for five-year periods with the option for renewal. There's a, rem a removal of um, comparability, which means that states could have multiple 1959s to target different populations and potentially have different benefit packages in those different um, 1959s. There's also an other category of services, which is something that previously wasn't available in the I, but is something I think that makes the 1915C so attractive to states um, because they can add other benefits that they think would be helpful, and they're not necessarily ones that are listed on the optional list of state plan benefits. Um, it also opens up the services to people at 300% of the federal poverty limit. Um, previously, that was only up to 150%. Um, and so these are some of the other things that make it more interesting. And the last thing that I, I wanted to um, leave you with about the 1959, even a little bit about the, um, the health homes provision before I turn it back over to Peggy, is that we are seeing um, with these two particular benefit packages, and I think a number of things in the Affordable Care Act, a little bit more of hybridization in our program lines that previously had not been integrated. You know, the 1915 CEAs had these rules and they did this for these populations, and the state plans did this, and they did this for these populations. And now we're starting to see, particularly with the 1959 and even with the health homes, that things are not starting to look quite the same, that they're begging and borrowing pieces from different options to bring together and hopefully in better ways that create better benefit packages for Medicaid um, recipients. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. I wanted to mention briefly something about mental health parity. Um, as you are probably aware, the Wellstone Domenici Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act of, t of 2008, which we call MAPIA for short, was passed by Congress in October of 2008 as part of President Bush's uh, stimulus package. In February of this year, 2010, the Federal Departments of Health and Human Services, Labor and Treasury published an interim final regulation in the Federal Register. The comment period closed May the 3rd of uh, 2010, and the, re the re regulation became effective July 1 of 2010. MAPIA applies to Medicaid managed care plans, CHIP state plans, and benchmark programs. Now, there's no real specific mention in MAPIA about Medicaid. So um, uh, I'll entertain a few questions when the time comes uh, for the question and answer period. But at this point in time, I'll just sort of make a general statement that uh, CMS and the Center for Medicaid, CHIP, and Survey and Certification is still very carefully um, looking at what the impact of parity has on the Medicaid managed care programs. Um, I'd like to close by um, leaving you with the vision of that the, uh, the Disabled and Elderly Health Programs Group has uh, formulated. We feel very carefully and deeply about the idea of having a sustainable, person-driven, long-term support system in which people with disabilities and chronic conditions have choice, control, and an access to a full array of quality services that assure optimal outcomes such as independence, health, and a quality of life. Thank you so much. We'll have our final presenter, Mary Rainwater from California's Integrated Behavioral Health Project. Okay, I'll be last, try and say something that hasn't been said. Um, so thank you, it's great to be here. Um, 
and um, share the podium with my esteemed colleagues. And um, I've learned a lot from them over the course of doing our initiative, so I'm going to share a little bit about that today. So let's see. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, give you a brief overview of the initiative that we've been doing in California and share a few of our key findings. We don't have time to go into everything, but... Um, I'll give you the big picture, and then I'm going to talk about a couple of pieces of work that we've commissioned through our funding that deal with the business case um, and the quality and cost improvements uh, associated with integration, and then try to talk a little bit about some work we commissioned that has to deal with what does all this mean for the federally qualified health centers in California, and particularly given the, the state of um, financing today in California and, and then what it might mean um, going forward under health reform. Whoops. It's, you can see I don't, I'm not very uh, technical. Okay, so here's our initiative. Um, we're a foundation-driven initiative, and um, we're, we're uh, supported by the California Endowment, and we were started in 2006. We're part of an organization in California called the Tide Center. And um, really, we were designed to really uh, build the field of integration in California for community health centers, which includes federally qualified health centers. So here's our goals, which are basically to improve behavioral health treatment access, reduce the stigma of seeking mental health services, improve patient outcomes, and strengthen collaboration between mental health and primary care providers. And the strategies that we have used in our initiative to achieve that are the following. Um, first of all, we make grants. Uh, uh, we give grants to community health centers, um, federally qualified, and community clinics to the consortia in California that are organized regionally to support clinics, and to a number of statewide organizations that really share the integration agenda that we share. Um, our grants range in size from 10000 to 75000 um, depending on the project we're doing. And we've really used our resources more as a hook to engage people to work with us on our initiative uh, goals and then to really build and support a robust learning community for those grantees around the integration issues that um, we are interested in. So people really function as thought partners with us in our, um, in our initiative. Um, we've done a number of policy and advocacy statewide projects, which I'll talk about a little bit. And we support training and technical assistance activities, both um, for our grantees and statewide. In fact, both Sandy and Dennis were early trainers for some of our grantees. And then, of course, we do all this through partnerships and collaborations. So here's our lessons learned, just some, some big picture findings. Um, we, we have a really robust website, um, which I think has been shared with everybody uh, if you're interested in and more information about any of these areas, you should definitely go there and take a look. But basically, um, what we know through the work that our grantees have done is that definitely the model that Dennis described of embedding behavior health uh, practitioners in primary care settings, because most of our grantees function in the same model that the Cherokee uh, provides, um, definitely leads to higher quality and improved access. And we also um, do surveys of all our providers in our grantee um, sites, and definitely there is very high provider satisfaction and patient satisfaction along the lines that Dennis mentioned. Um, operationally, we know that it requires customization, so within our project, we've developed a number of actual toolkits and hands-on materials that providers can use within their clinics to sort of um, adopt best practices, and it's definitely not a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, as Peggy said about Medicaid, you hear that a lot about clinics in California. When you've seen one clinic, you've seen one clinic. So there has to really be a need to customize the approaches that people are allowed to use. Um, one other thing I want to mention about operations is that all of our grantees have talked about how important it is to have shared communication between the primary care practitioners and the behaviorists, and um, even if it's a water cooler communication exchange, but really um, the use of communication and frequent and consistent communication, and obviously IT is the desirable, one desirable mechanism is really important. And in terms of the financing, um, we know that um, for our grantees, the model has, re has resulted in lower health care costs. And so our initiative has really concluded that, you know, there is value to be had and that there are cost savings that can be generated by providing um, behavioral health services, particularly for the mild and moderate um, behavioral health conditions in primary care settings. 
So I mentioned that we've been doing some policy work and one of the um, statewide activities we've been engaged in is one of the waivers that um, Peggy and Nancy were just talking about. And in California, it's actually the 1115 Medicaid waiver on the healthcare side. Um, so our state is in the process of renewing their Medicaid waiver. And as part of that process this year, the state, um, California, the state of California Department of Healthcare Services um, set up a, behavior, a, t a behavioral health technical work group, which actually basically we funded and staffed and then um, participated as technical experts to the state on that uh, work group. And in California, the state, uh, uh, the state agency is interested in renewing the waiver and trying to find a way to bend the cost curve associated with the Medicaid fee-for-service population that has co-occurring chronic medical and behavioral health conditions because they're very costly. For example, in California, 11% of the fee-for-service Medi-Cal patients have a serious mental illness, and healthcare spending for these individuals is 3.7 times greater than it is for all Medicaid uh, fee-for-service enrollees in California. So our state is spending 14000 $635 per year on that high uh, population versus 3914 on um, the population that doesn't have the, the um, co comorbidity issues. So they're very motivated to move this population into a managed care or organized delivery system model and to think and, and are thinking for the first time about how they would embed behavioral health into these new managed care or organize, organized delivery system models. So our work group was tasked with um, providing some guidance to the state on what that might look like um, if they wanted to do behavioral health pilots or however they wanted to sort of roll that out. So we convened a group of mental health, primary care, substance use, plan providers, payers, um, and uh, consumers, and came up with a list of five core elements that we recommended that the state include in any kind of integrated behavioral health approach that they're going to require if they'll use that term, <laughs> of plans as they try to move this population into a managed care system. And in addition to that, we also suggested that they set up these five domains to track the uh, implementation of those best practices to make sure that um, they would be successful. So for us in California, that was quite um, a small victory because we are a 1915B state, which means that our, ma our mental health and our substance use service is completely carved out of the healthcare agency. And there's not really, hasn't historically been a lot of coordination and collaboration around services. So, so for the first time, they're starting to get that if they really want to bend the cost curve, they've got to address this issue. Um, another statewide policy activity that um, our work has supported is the production of a new report called Building the Business Case for Bidirectional Integrated Care, um, which was um, done by Barb Maurer and Del Jarvis, who are consultants that do quite a bit of work in the behavioral health side and have done a lot of work for our project. And um, I'm not going to go over the details of the report. It's got lots and lots of great data. I don't know. I did send the link, so hopefully it's available to people on the website here. And it's definitely on our website. But I think what's interesting about the paper that they developed is the hypothesis that they used uh, uh, sort of to outline why this was so important. And basically what they said is that without addressing the health care needs of persons with serious mental health substance use disorders and the mental health substance use treatment needs of the whole population, it's going to be very difficult to achieve the Institute for Healthcare Improvement's triple aim of improving the health of the population, enhancing the patient experience, and reducing or at least controlling the per capita cost of total health care. So that's their theory and their hypothesis about why it's so important to kind of understand the business case. And um, one of the studies on, I just pulled out um, on, on this chart some of the ones that I found more interesting, and it's really as I said, comprehensive data that's available at this point in time. But one of the ones that was most interesting to me was the first one, which is the Kaiser study, because what they found is that improving the health of, those, of people with substance use conditions may well benefit the entire family uh, members of a, somebody with a substance use condition. Um, in Kaiser, Northern California, family members of patients with substance use disorders had greater health care cost and were more likely to be diagnosed with a number of medical conditions, something like 12 times as 
many medical conditions diagnoses as a family member of a similar person who didn't happen to have somebody in their family with a substance use condition. And what they found is that if a family member with a substance use condition was abstinent for one year um, after treatment, the health care costs, not just of that person with a substance use disorder, but of their entire family was reduced if they stayed in treatment and even one year out after treatment. So I think that's pretty impressive. And we haven't seen a lot of really good substance use um, data as much as we have started to see on the mental health side. So I think that's really important. Uh, several other of these on this list are also just interesting for the work that we're doing in California. Um, including that the impact trials that um, are listed here are ones that are really working with that population that the state of California is interested in trying to bend the cost curve around in um, the 1115 waiver renewal. So their summary really is that, number one, it's really important as we roll these out to have fidelity to the model, which is a really big challenge in um, implementing behavior health integration. Dennis's point about what is integrated care is alive and well in the field, but uh, <laughs> that's going to be a big challenge going forward. And that, um, but I think we know that um, by replicating these models, we can expect to see um, reductions in overall, overall health care costs and improvement in outcomes and quality of life for the people who those programs serve. Um, and they kind of close by saying health care reform has kind of put the uh, stake in the sand that says we're going to link the ability to demonstrate quality outcomes with managing costs. So bidirectionality and integration is going to be more important than ever, especially for these populations that are um, historically uh, helped by the safety net system, which is the group of clinics we work with. So I'm going to shift gears now and talk about um, a body of work that um, we just helped to support in California by Del Jarvis, who happens to be the business partner of um, Barb Mauer, and as part of our ongoing training that we do um, for, uh, for provider groups in the state of California, he just did a, a series of webinars on what does um, the integration landscape look like for federally qualified health centers today and what's the future hold for them. And um, his, his advice is that for today, uh, federally qualified health centers really have to develop a six-step integration game plan. Um, to deal with the current financing constraints. And I just want to mention his analogy that he used to talk about the, the second bullet point, which is identifying and addressing the funding barriers. He said that really what this requires uh, in the short term is the serenity prayer model, meaning that um, there are a lot of federal and state laws and regulations that um, provide barriers to really developing an integrated care model. So that requires at the provider level, I don't know, maybe Dennis, you've done this, the serenity prayer moment where you you ask for the serenity to accept the things you can't change, the courage to change the things you can, and the wisdom to know the difference between the two, because some of these things just aren't going to happen in the short term. Um, but I thought that was kind of a unique analogy. Um, but having said that, what he goes on to argue is that really, and this is really true in California, all health care is local. That even though there are national and state edicts and rules and regulations, it's really at the local level that what he calls e uh, ecosystems of health care delivery are formed and come together. And really, unless you get the players, the mental health, the substance use, and the primary care providers to get together at the local level and figure out what you can pay for, what I can't pay for, you know, mental health can pay for this, primary care can pay for that. You're not really going to be able to get over the, the current integration uh, funding challenge. So this represents kind of a, a county in the center as the ecosystem in California. Um, some of the things that present, prevent the alignment of current funding are things that Dennis really mentioned, so it's good to know there's some national consistency. Um, you know, same kinds of issues that we've identified through our policy work make it really hard to integrate, and those include service codes and allowable costs, the site of service, uh, who can provide and bill for services, service limits based on certain uh, regulations, and then target populations and consumer um, coverage issues. So and like some of the issues that Dennis mentioned in California, some of what that means is that we don't get to uh, reimbursement for fairly qualified health centers for same-day visits. Um, they don't get reimbursed for care management associated with mental health services. Um, they don't. They can get disallowments if they bill for something that just has a mental health diagnosis and corresponding mental health treatment, and they can't get reimbursed for the use of MFT. So those are all barriers that exist today. 
still in California. So what about the future? Well, um, we think that there is some op um, some reason to be um, optimistic under health care reform, as this group well knows. Um, there are three components of health care reform, all of which should provide some opportunity for better integration financing for federally qualified health care centers. Uh, first, universal coverage, which will now include parity, although I think these conversations about how Medicaid is going to interpret parity are going to be extremely important. And I know at our state level, they're already happening and highly charged. Um, the delivery system redesign will allow for the whole rollout of the medical homes and the accountable care organizations and all that, which still has to be figured out, really does provide, I think, opportunity for fairly qualified health systems. Payment reform, which includes things like the case rates, the global payments, all those theoretically are opportunities to better integrate the system. But it's going to require what um, Barb Maurer and Dale Jarvis call the big fix, which is basically inverting the resource allocation pie. So we got to move to um, a system where prevention activities are more fully funded and widely deployed, where primary care is uh, services are uh, increased, and hopefully um, the workforce <laughs> comes with that, so that we can see a decrease in the demand of specialty and acute care systems. And of course, this isn't going to magically happen. It's going to take a lot of leadership at the national, state, and local levels, which leads us kind of back to the situation we're in today, which is sort of a puzzle. So again, these represent sort of the pieces of the puzzle in California and um, what Dale Jarvis calls the existing raw ingredients of the new ecosystem, ecosystem which is yet to be formed in response to health care um, uh, legislation, the health, new health care laws. But Really, it is going to take coming together around what new opportunities the um, health care law will present to the local communities as well as at the state level. Um, in California, in the short term, we are really um, working hard to make sure that the state uses the 1115 waiver process as the roadway and pathway to um, to a uh, better integrated and to get us ready for health care reform. So in summary, I'll just say that, you know, we have no answers necessarily in California yet, just some observations and a hypothesis, which is um, really that health care reform and parity can really change everything. Um, that federal health care reform will trigger dramatic changes in how health and mental health and substance use services are organized. Uh, these changes will create a tipping point in how the health care needs of persons with serious mental illness, but also how the mental health substance needs of all um, health of, of all Americans are really addressed. And that that will change the way hopefully mental health and substance use services are funded and fit into the new health care ecosystems both at our local levels, our state levels, and nationally. So that's our hypothesis. We'll see if we're right. Um, I'll stop there. Well, thank you again to, to all of our speakers. Uh, and now we have about a half hour. We have a hard stop right at 5 o'clock, and then we can move uh, downstairs uh, at the stairs just outside these doors to, uh, to our reception. Uh, so let me open it up um, to all of you. Um, again, uh, if you have a question, I guess just raise your hand and we'll, we'll do it that way. Um, and don't forget, like I did, uh, push the button to talk and press it when you're done. Yes, hi. Pardon me. Uh, my name is Al Guida. I'm with Guide Consulting Services, and one of my clients is the National Council for Community Behavioral Health Care. We say that's Latin for community mental health centers. Um, uh, there have been a number of derogatory statements made about those providers today. I'm, I'm not going to address them. I just wanted to have a, I wanted to have a direct uh, a question to uh, Peggy and Nancy. Thank you for being here. It was an outstanding presentation. I was hoping you could bring us up to speed on where CMS is regarding the regulations for the Medicaid medical home. Just very briefly, Senator Stabenow passed an amendment during Senate Finance Committee consideration of what became health care reform legislation to specifically require persons with mental illnesses to be served by those medical homes. That, that's the legislative history. And the reason why that is uh, is that um, many Medicare and Medicaid 
uh, care coordination programs to date studiously avoid serving people with mental illnesses, hence the horrific death rates that were referred to a few moments ago in that patient population. So I just w w was hoping for two things very briefly. Could you bring us up to speed on where you are in the regulatory process as it relates to propounding rules for the Medicaid medical home that was authorized in uh, health care reform? And then secondly, frankly, we have an agenda. Uh, the, the, um, there are very few actual partnerships between uh, uh, FQHCs and community mental health centers today. A very few working relationships on the ground. And we are hoping that the Medicaid medical home rules will propound those partnerships on a mandatory basis so that persons with severe mental illnesses served in the existing specialty uh, public mental health system can have access to primary care and specialty medical services. Again, the reason why these folks are dying at such a horrific rate is because there's very little access to those services today. Okay. <laughs> Um, in terms of the regulations related to the, the, you're talking specifically about the health home provision, Section 2703, in, okay, in the Affordable Care Act. We're, we're working on things related to all of the, uh, all of the things that affect CMS related to, to health care reform, and certainly the health home um, component is one of them. I'm one of three co-leads that's working on it. We have an awful lot of work to do. The provision has lots of components to it, lots of moving parts. Um, and the time frame is actually pretty tight when you think about it because the program at least goes live. Um, states can apply for a state plan um, amendment uh, as of uh, January 1, 2011. It doesn't specifically state that regulations are going to be on the street by that date, though. So um, I would say stay tuned. Um, I think that there would be guidance um, coming from CMS um, prior to issuing of a notice of proposed rulemaking um, and then the final regulations. Um, so I'm sorry I'm not in a position to provide more information about that. Um, the other piece that you talked about was mandating that there would be greater collaboration around the, the, the mental health piece and the other components um, in the health home. Well, I mean, specifically ad addressed in the legislation was the different kinds of, of conditions that would be there, the different chronic conditions that would be there. So I think that, that very much there was... Um, an acknowledgement of that. Um, it, it's going to be, I think, very interesting for us because clearly on the ground, and it was so interesting to hear from the other panelists, um, there are really interesting pockets of things happening um, where that kind of collaboration is happening. Um, it will be interesting to see um, as states look at, because for the, this provision, uh, um, a, a provider like Cherokee, for example, can't come and ask for a, a state plan amendment to do this. This would be done through the states. Um, so it will be interesting to see how this happens when folks are looking at ramping it up on a larger scale. Hi, I'm Jenny Crawford, and I actually um, run a community mental health center in Maryland, and that's why I'm so grateful to be here to hear you all. Um, our community mental health center is um, serves almost all Medicaid, Medicare, uninsured, and it's that quadrant four of high behavioral health need and high primary health need. And so with trepidation and great excitement, we are on the brink of a partnership with a community, a federal qualified community health center, which is across the street. And um, we've just received a small grant, and we're crossing our fingers to get a SAMHSA four-year grant um, that would allow us to have a microcosm to see whether we could sustain the integration model that we've designed. Um, so I am eager to hear because you know we're starting to look at what codes can we bill, you know, where can we bill for the the critical care management communication between our psychiatrists and the primary care physicians. Um, and you know the other kind of ancillary um, health screenings. You know, I know from your level that you're looking at this at a national level, and every state health care plan is is different. But I'm looking for any kind of technical assistance I can get to make sure that we get off the ground as well as we can with this. Um, I don't know if Dennis has any resources, but you know, NC 
see National Council of Community Behavioral Health actually has a paper that was done recently um, by Kathy Reynolds um, that uh, is a pretty good tool. I don't know if Marilyn's in it. Is that, <laughs> I don't know if that's it. Does she have it? Well, so that's a good place to go. And she is just like a fountain of information and can spew codes off the top of her head. Um, and she probably knows Marilyn. Um, we actually have one of the early SAMHSA demonstration projects in California in San Diego. And if you want to follow up with me uh, later, I can put you in touch with our grantees that are there. They may have some ideas for you. But it is so state-driven, that whole code issue. I don't know, Dennis, if you want to add anything. But definitely, Kathy's paper is probably one of the state-of-the-art pieces on that. It is challenging because it is so much state-driven. And in terms of training for those kind of collaborations, we have a training academy and you know, FQHCs and CMHCs often come in tandem together. Uh, we've, we've had three of the current grantees visit, for example. I think in general, there has to be some kind of new coding system, new stream of revenue. When we negotiate contracts, we always try to get global streams of funding rather than fee-for-service because so much of what really transpires in integration is not a clinical service. There's a lot of collaboration, a lot of cross-consultation among providers, and there's, you really can't code you know, 30 or 40 of those transactions in a day's time. So you need some kind of a rate. And lately, we've negotiated a kind of a care management rate that's triggered by people who are in the system. There's fee for service underneath that. If you're an FQHC, there's cost-based reimbursement, so you don't leave that. But then over and above, some kind of a monthly rate. You know, sometimes it's PMPM, PM, sometimes it's triggered by an encounter. But some kind of mechanism that's going to pick up the infrastructure of integration. We we also have. Um, where Dennis trains the sort of the leadership of a, a system to work together, we have added our uh, training for the folks who are on the ground uh, in uh, integrating integrated or in care for the uh, severely and persistently mentally ill. And so our program now has a, a new uh, workshop that makes the whole program targeted for that part, those clinicians. And I just remembered, I think on our website, we have a training that we did on this archive, so you might want to go look at our, um, our website as well. I run a technical assistance center for SAMHSA for the targeted capacity expansion grants for um, evidence-based practices. This is a huge, uh, this is the longest title I've ever had in any job. Um, evidence-based practices for older adults. I have of 10 programs that are grantees, I have two that are working with um, variations on impact models to try and coordinate with primary care and they are having incredible problems dealing with the primary care system. This is free service to these providers. In Chicago, we have a grantee, the Brighton Program at Rush Medical Center. Great program. They are having huge difficulties getting into the Cook County Hospital System. It's fine, they have great support from their Rush primary care geriatric group. They love it and they have very good support from a community. I think it may be a federally qualified health center that serves a Spanish speaking population. But the general um, primary care service at uh, Cook County Hospital, the nurses won't allow them in. The nurses will not allow them in. And they don't even deal with primary care physicians because they can't get past the gatekeepers. So that's a real problem. In uh, Indianapolis, my program has been negotiating with a federally qualified health center. They have uh, 
a person co-located, but they have very low response rate from the physicians in the practice. This is free to that practice. They are having great deal of difficulty negotiating with the management in that practice in Indianapolis to get them to agree to this. So I think there are still real bugs in this, pro in this system and it really behooves CMS on both sides because these patients are older adults, they are Medicare beneficiaries and there, there are no clear rules about how to get reimbursed from Medicare. My grantees are looking to sustain these programs because they have great evidence. They're a wrap, we have 10 programs, they're all different, they're wraparounds, they're all kinds of things. Um, and uh, it's really hard to figure out how to sustain these programs. And these are evidence-based models, so they have validity. Do the primary care physicians get some kind of extra award for seeing these patients? Yeah, they get help with their patients. No, <laughs> that's, not, that's not what I meant by reward. The cost of it. It's not about cost. Well, why are they physicians then? <laughs> I appreciate and, and completely uh, um, understand and support your indignation. Um, but one of the things about the, the patient center medical home is that people get rewarded financially for taking on more complex patients. And that as you look out in the primary care world, primary care physicians look at other physicians and see themselves as the lowest paid group and the hardest worked group. And when I have been in, I can't tell you how many meetings, I'm a, I'm a staff member of a primary care practice, and I can't tell you how many meetings I've been in where someone comes in with one more damn thing that the doctors are supposed to do because primary care is the access to everything. And, the, and watching the indignation there of we, we're, we're, we're here till seven o'clock at night, our kids don't know what we look like, and I am not gonna do this is something that I've listened to a lot. And so the, the reorganization that allows the doctor to see patients more longer term in, to deal with the patients uh, in more depth is exactly what pays off for doctors. They love that, but most organizations, and they also need to be paid more, uh, which is hard to do in a non, say in a non-physician group. Um, but um, that's what's going to turn it around. Um, and just there, there is people are out beyond mission now. They're strained beyond mission. I just wanted to add a comment that I think Sandy's absolutely right. Uh, but even beyond that, what you're talking about coming in contact with, I'm sure Dennis has experienced it, is a big culture. It's a, it's a culture shift to do this kind of work. And medicine and mental health, medical, you know, primary care and mental health don't necessarily, don't at all come from the same cultures and backgrounds. So that's partly what is going on. And our, our grantees have talked about how they had to internally market within their own primary care clinic as the behaviorists, how to get the physicians to know how to use them. So it really is a challenging and a complex issue. But financing reform is going to make a huge difference. But even with the financing on the table, we're still talking about a shift in culture. And so again, our website, we've done a lot of trainings on this. We have a lot of tools. That's why we developed hands-on tools for people to use in trying to make this integration a little bit more easy to do. But that's just a whole other conversation that we could get into. Okay, my name is Sue Salkowitz, and I work mostly on the health information technology side of things, which has been mentioned in many of these presentations. And the incentives, the Medicare, the CMS incentives for quotes meaningful use, which have just been passed, have also placed a race to get that technology installed. In the regional extension centers, the community health centers and the safety net providers, the critical access hospitals have priority in terms of getting some kind of system in the door. 
there are very few systems out there that are certified to handle the kind of integrative work with behavioral health, even after planning has been happening, which has been happening in health centers that I've been associated with also, to actually find technology <laughs> that supports that. So the race to get the meaningful use has financial benefits, particularly to Medicaid providers, to get those systems in and report meaningful use. And the type of quality indicators that they have in there are possibly able to be reported. But I see the possibility of their getting an expensive and inadequate system to support the kind of even just regular patient-centered medical home, much less an integrated one with behavior. So I, I would add that to the list of, of barriers and problems that people are doing. And I think the other thing, when we talk about health information technology, there's there's getting equipment, there's getting programs, and then there's getting people comfortable using them as a part of their daily life and getting carving out time to train on how it can be beneficial. I think what Sandy said was so important that when we talk about shifting paradigms, people, everybody has to understand from the person who's receiving services, the people who are providing services, the states who are funding at CMS, what is the value in doing it for them? And I think that um, that that will be a shift, a harder shift in certain places than other places, depending on how much um, certain practices have already de de um, depended on technology. Um, I just add that you also have the confidentiality issues too that some folks are still concerned about around mental health and substance use uh, records. Good afternoon. My name is Marguerite Duane, and I'm a family physician and a medical director of a community health center here in the District of Columbia. And Sandy, I appreciate your comments. Um, I, as a family physician, I'm very committed to integrating primary and uh, behavioral health services and. I feel as family physicians, we're very well trained to do that, at least in, in some programs. And it does make a difference when you're trained in that culture to approach patients um, from that perspective. But as a FP and a medical director, I also see the indignation of the primary care physicians that are constantly on a hamster wheel and asked to see more and more and more patients and do this task and that task and not get reimbursed for it. I, I on faculty at Georgetown, and medical students are coming out with three, four hundred thousand dollars in debt. When I started a community health center here in D.C. six years ago, the starting full-time salary was eighty thousand dollars. That's not a lot for somebody with a medical degree and two to three hundred thousand dollars in debt. So it's really hard. Um, the other issue is with the FQHC model. Um, the community health center where I was at previously was an FQHC. The one I'm at now is not. And part of the reason why we're not is there are so many requirements for number of people seen. I mean, we were required to see 11 patients in a four-hour period. Most of the patients that we see don't speak English, you know, have very complex, you know, social histories in addition to their medical problems. And it's really challenging to see 11 of them in a four-hour period and, and adequately address the problems. And so we're a medical director now. We're not an FQHC, and we have the luxury of a 30-minute patient visit. And it is. It's truly um, a luxury. But because we're not an FQHC, we're at a disadvantage for becoming eligible for any uh, money for electronic health records, for providing mental health services. And a lot of the talks today are really focused on integrating the FQHC and the community mental health center. But what about the non-FQHC community health centers? And the medical center that I'm the medical director for is part of Catholic Charities, and Catholic Charities is a huge social services mental health component. Um, they're not interested in working with us, even though we're within the organization, because we're not an FQHC. And, you know, there are grant opportunities that come available, and, you know, we just watch them go by. But I don't want to sacrifice the time that we have with our patients to get on that hamster wheel of, you know, all the reporting and requirements that, that are that are incumbent upon FQHC. So I guess my question really relates to what about the non-FQHC community health centers or FQHC lookalikes and how can we how can we come to the table to integrate care? You know, we're starting, we've 
we start offering mental health services with a therapist in our center, and it's really helped uh, a lot. We want to do more of that, but it's it's challenging when the reimbursement isn't there, isn't there, and the grants aren't there because we're not under the umbrella of an FQHC. Uh, one of the more successful non-FQHC safety net clinics that I know of is the Marillac Clinic in Grand Junction, Colorado. Uh, Marillac is also in a Catholic um, health system. And uh, they got grants to get started with integrated care. Um, but they kept integrated care going because they saved enough in the ER um, for uncompensated care that it more than paid for the behavioral health services that they were maintaining. And so the fact that the the system was one system and one pot of money um, made, it, um, made it possible in a way that fee-for-service billing uh, never would have allowed. Um, and if you want to see that a program that has developed very well, very similar to what happens at Cherokee, the Marillac Clinic is a good one to look at. And we, re we really began you know, as a community mental health center doing primary care. So, you know, for about 10 years, you know, we were essentially like you without actually the look-alike designation. And still about half of our offices are look-alike. We're in areas that don't qualify. I think you talked about the expectation on the number of visits. Our target is 19, you know, per day. We generally don't get there because we see, we see a lot of folks that are bilingual and you know, we've got translators for refugees and we've got homeless people that are very, very sick. Uh, and the FQHC system doesn't come down on us. We get data you know, that compares kind of the expectation and we know we've got to generate enough revenue to make it. As, as a look like, you do get cost-based reimbursement, right? You just don't get the grant. I think in, in our state, the lookalikes and the FQHCs are all part of the Primary Care Association. I mean, they all get the same kind of training. They all, ben they all get the same benefits. And I would trust that would be the same here. In California, uh, we're asking that question. Um, we work very closely with our California Primary Care Association, which represents a number of clinics who are not FQHCs and are just licensed community clinics. And I, I think the future is unknown, frankly. Um, the foundation that we're doing our work for has really said that, you know, FQHCs are really kind of a new... Um, they have historically been very supportive of supporting FQHCs, community clinics, and lookalikes, the whole um, sort of cadre of clinics in California. But more and more, they're seeing lots of federal dollars coming to the FQHCs and um, don't necessarily see them as needy as they used to be um, when we started supporting their work. But I do think within the work we're doing over the next several months, sort of looking at what does this all mean for clinics, this health home, and that is a very um, important question because there are a lot of really important important providers that are not FQHC specifically in California. So I'll keep you posted if we come up with any panaceas for you. But. We're coming down to the last few minutes. All right. Uh, Peter Gomez del Tarum Institute. And I had two general questions for any or all panelists. The first was that I had heard that really the, the uh, Wellstone Domenici Parity Act may not be the governing factor on whether Medicaid uh, covers uh, behavioral health uh, services. I had heard that the minimum benefit package that will be established for the exchanges will also become the minif minimum benefit package for Medicaid and that that package would include behavioral health services. So I I was wondering if anyone else had heard that, if there's any knowledge of whether that's accurate or not. And then the second one is, uh, as we're moving towards patient-centered patient medical homes, of course, one of the obvious problems is the uh, uh, short supply of primary care physicians and the extent to which they're overextended. Uh, I know that uh, uh, a coalition of uh, behavioral health providers, which I think included at NCCBH, uh, uh, the Coalition for Whole Health, uh, came up with a somewhat broader concept of a health 
home, which was reflected in SAMHSA's document on the, on the topic as well. And so it would seem to me that one of the potential solutions is, is perhaps some system, at least initially, for determining a, uh, a locus of, uh, of care management based on certain criteria that could make it broader than just the PC in the PC clinic simply because you're going to have to shut people out or overextend your homes to the extent where it won't function. And I was wondering if folks could potentially comment on those, those two uh, items. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Um, I will um, say that I, I'm not sure there's lots of ideas and, and comments out there. Folks are second-guessing sort of what we may, may do or, or what we have said we'll do. And at this point, we're still really, uh, we've not produced any guidance to states or to, to anyone because we're, we want to very carefully study the issue and see exactly how, um, how we feel the, the um, parity issues will affect Medicaid. Uh, and that specifically the reference is Medicaid managed care. But I think there are a lot of folks that you know have a much broader idea of what they think it should be. And so uh, we want to be sure that we're um, fair about what we do and that we really understand what the implications are if we go this way, that way, or, or whatever. And of course, um, we've looked pretty carefully at the regulation, which was not produced for Medicaid, but was produced for the commercial market. And uh, so I, I think that it's an important topic and it does have broad impact. And uh, what we may end up doing may be the beginning of other things that will happen in the future, but where we are right now, um, I can't comment that we're going in one direction or another. We're really studying it very carefully. It's a complex issue. It's not something that's that easy to come up with a plan. I can speak to the second issue a bit, and not so much on how it's going to be organized in statute, but the, one of the problems with imagining a distributed system is that the workforce in that distributed system right now tends not to work well on the other side, whichever side it is. And that goes for care managers as well. And so. Um, Mental health case managers have been around a long time. It's an honorable profession, there are a lot of them. Most of them do not have experience in or much ability to function in a medical type setting. That's one of the things we do in our program. Um, there's a person out there named Roger Kathol, K-A-T-H-O-L. He's an internist and psychiatrist. And he trains care and case managers to work across um, the divide. So he does what he calls integrated case management um, and has training programs and a book out that just came out um, worth looking at. They use complexity as the tool to decide who gets it rather than how sick a person is. And his complexity tool is kind of complex, but, uh, but it's, it's quite telling. It's, it's a very interesting thing worth looking at. I feel constrained to mention uh, maternity care, the infant mortality rates in this country, the increasing uh, maternal mortality rates in this country, and the addressing of the disparities. Uh, I have great sympathy for the lady who's left now, I guess, the primary, oh, primary care physician. Uh, having, we're running a, a program in Ward 5 here in the district because uh, we wanted to see if we could reduce the uh, precursors to infant mortality in this town, which has the worst outcomes in the country, in our nation's capital, in terms of infant mortality. And we have, we have been successful in doing that, but again, it takes the time. And I have refused, as the founder, I refused to go FQHC because I could see what it would mean to us. We could not spend the time with the women. And that brings me to another facet of integration, which which is, the, I think that we get the results that we do, and we have reduced the 
preterm birth by more than two thirds, the low birth weight by from 14.5 to 3%. Now I'm talking about African American people and the cesarean section from 31.5 to 10%. In 2006, we saved more money for the system using proxies than our operating expense. But from Medicaid managed care, we get half our charges. So every year I have to go out and raise half the budget. And it's just, it seems really counterintuitive, but um, it, it's a question to me of not taking a new service because we have a, a, a what we call a family health and birth center, which is a freestanding birth center. Mind you, we're dealing with high risk African American people and 70% of them do go to the hospital for birth, but the same midwives go with them. We don't send them off to strangers. So I'm, I'm just um, wondering if anybody has any ideas about what nurse managed clinics might mean to the delivery of health care and, and uh, the whole idea of prevention because that's what we function on and, and what, for example, programs like Healthy Start have to do with integrated care, which entails a lot of home visiting and so forth. I can hear the answers coming. They're just, <laughs> they're just flying at me. But I have to say, which I always say when I go up on the hill, hey, when I'm ready to leave, hey, there's a little bit of urgency here. I'm 83 years old. <laughs> so, so I'm not having any more babies, believe it or not. But, <laughs> but, I, but what, what the services that we provide mean for the women and their, their inborn depression is really amazing to see. And I would like to invite any and all of you to come and see us at 801 17th Street Northeast. So I'll just say that you actually are closing on a comment I opened with with a colleague of mine who's here in the room today who works in the world of prevention and childhood care. And I said, you know, one of the things we haven't done a good job of in my project, I can't speak for others, is really this whole population and these whole ideas and that we're going to continue, we're going to actually start working Working more closely together around this because it's just, I think, really a part of the field that's just underdeveloped. So if we're going to prevent um, mental illness in the kids, the place to start is with women in pregnancy and to build their self-confidence and, and their self-esteem. And that's what we're able to do. And that's why we get these results. I know we're being studied by the Urban Institute, but uh, because we have to prove that we're doing okay. End of story. Um, we thank everybody for coming. Uh, we appreciate everyone's participation. I encourage these discussions to continue as we head downstairs uh, for, uh, for a reception that you are all uh, happy to, uh, welcome to attend. Um, again, thank you to our panelists. We appreciate your participation and knowledge. And thanks to all of you.